got it. We're good. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. Today, I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Martin Marin from Leahy in Boston. Well, Burlington. I got to get Burlington and Boston. Basically Boston, right. It's basically Boston. Boston. It's basically Boston, right. Well, good to be here as always. Hello. So good morning. You had a little vacation. Kids out to California, got some r and I hope you're feeling refreshed. Yeah, no, it was good to go out to California from the Northeast to experience the worst uh, storm in Southern California's history in the last, I don't know, 100 years. Um, so, you know, it was good to see, it was good to see snow in Southern California as if we hadn't seen it enough here. So in that sense, it was great. Um, so you were, in, you were in Southern California for that. Yeah. And then I left New Jersey the day after HCM Awareness Day to go to California Right. To, um, we had not had any snow other than like a dusting here in New Jersey. Right. And I don't fly in February because I'm afraid of snow. So I mm. was like panicked that it was going to be a snowstorm. And we got to the airport and they said, it's snowing in San Francisco. I'm like, it doesn't snow in San Francisco. They said, yeah, we know that's why this is really weird. So you went to Southern California for snow. I went to Northern California for snow. Yeah. We were not meant to get away from bad weather. I think that's the message there. Um, for sure. It Best was, laid uh, plans. It was frustrating. Yeah. But life goes on. Absolutely. So here we are in March. We have yep. gotten through Heart Month and HCM Awareness Day. Everything was great. Um, we really appreciate everybody's contributions to the event that day. And um we had 17 states recognize HCM Awareness Day by proclamation, resolution, or nice. law. So yay and thank you to all of those states. We will be knocking on your door shortly for um, the, the follow-up, which will be moving the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act forward through multiple states. So we look forward to working with our all of it, all of our partners on that initiative. So we find ourselves in March, which is a month we have kind of dedicated to discussing arrhythmias in HCM and what we do to manage arrhythmias, detect arrhythmias, and protect against arrhythmias. So, Marty, can you just talk real basically for a minute? What is an arrhythmia? Sure. It's a general term for an irregular or abnormal electrical impulse in the heart that could be from either the upper chambers of the heart, which are called the atria, or it could come from the bottom chambers, the, the, ventric the ventricles, as we say. And the, <clears throat> the, the implications of where those rhythms are originate from, upper or lower chamber, and what type of rhythm um, dictates the significance of the ry abnormal rhythm and what we do. So, we typically think of HCM as a structural heart disease, but it right. has an arrhythmia component to it. Can you talk in some basic percentages? What percent of patients are going to deal with atrial arrhythmias versus ventricular arrhythmias versus probably not a problem? Right. So that's a so the, the I think you raised sort of at the beginning of that question kind of an important point about HCM is a structural heart disease. When we use that term, we're saying essentially that the heart muscle is abnormal. The muscle, is what are the structure of the heart, is abnormal. So it's thicker than it should be. But also when we look into that muscle in HCM, it is also abnormal, the structure, what we call the cellular structure, right? So the cells of HCM, the heart cells are abnormal, and there can be other abnormal components too, like scar tissue, um, in the muscle and all that together is why the muscle in HCM is thicker than it should. So that's the structural problem. But those structural problems are in a way directly connected to electrical in a way, because anytime you've got any changes to the structure, and it's not just HCM, but it can also be other heart diseases where structural changes can occur, that essentially lowers the threshold or makes it more likely for electrical, abnormal electrical rhythms, arrhythmias to develop in either the upper or lower chambers of the heart. So those are connected. That's an important point. So in other words, it's not a coincidence really 
that HCM patients could be a greater, are a greater risk, I should say, of, of arrhythmias because that structural change makes it more likely for the heart to trigger abnormal rhythms. And if we talk, so then, so the second part of the question is really about, there are a number of different types of arrhythmias from the upper chamber, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of different, less, uh, less number, but some different ones from the bottom chamber. And the, in general, the upper chamber ones, the ones we're most concerned with there is something called atrial fibrillation, okay? It's one of the types of upper chamber arrhythmias. It's not unique to HCM. It can occur in anyone and it occurs actually more commonly as all of us get older, but it's more likely to occur for the reasons we just talked about in HCM because of the structural changes. And then there are ventricular arrhythmias from the bottom chamber in HCM that uh, are obviously very abnormal and have a different implication than atrial fibrillation. Maybe we can dive deeper into the differences in how we approach the treatment of those two arrhythmias in a minute. But those are those are the two that we're most concerned with. Okay, so we'll we're going to go to the bottom first and the top second. Okay, um, because we know that HGM has this nasty um, reputation as being right. a cause of sudden cardiac arrest. It is true. We mm -hmm. are um, at higher risk than the average population for cardiac arrest from a ventricular right. arrhythmia. Um, but it's still relatively rare within the community. But we've identified risk factors that we believe are pretty um, good at identifying those who are at high risk. Right. And moderate risk. Um, nobody is at zero risk. That's right. Um, but we can kind of classify the really high risks. That's kind of an easier ask than the moderate where we're still kind of in gray zone. So let's tear this apart and look about number one. What I want, to, I want to ask this in two ways at the same time. So I'm going to ask them both and you figure out which way you want to answer it. Um, so there are high risk features that we can identify through clinical testing and questions and symptoms. And then there is the underlying anatomy that makes the heart prone to arrhythmias. And you're taking that underlying anatomy and why it's prone to arrhythmias. And we have figured out ways to see if those things are present family history of sudden cardiac arrest is but one of the factors. Massive right. hypertrophy is another. But I want to try to have everybody be able to hear us and understand that a test is just a test of telling us what's underlying. And you cannot study for these tests. They are what they are. Right. Um, so I want to talk about some of the risk factors. Sure. Absolutely. You know, and so, you know, what you were kind of talking about there is how we go about identifying which HCM patients may in the future be at high risk or greater risk for an out of the blue arrhythmia from the bottom chamber of the heart. Those are again called ventricular arrhythmias or ventricular tachycardia, VT is sometimes what you'll see. Occasionally, you'll also see ventricular fibrillation, VF. So VT and VF are just the acronyms for these abnormal bottom chamber rhythms that are responsible for a cardiac arrest. And that's what they that's what the issue is, a cardiac arrest. And just, just so for everybody listening, because sometimes the terminology here is a little confusing between cardiac arrest and heart attack. Heart attack, just to be clear, is generally a term, a layman's term for when there's a blockage of the arteries supplying blood to the heart muscle. That blockage is a heart attack, which can then lead to, as well, a cardiac arrest, which is the term just referring to the generation of the abnormal rhythm. And the reason that those abnormal rhythms cause a cardiac arrest is that ventricular arrhythmias from the bottom chamber, if they occur, are very fast. So that's the issue. They're very fast. And because they're so fast, much faster than a patient's normal heart rate, okay? And because they're so fast, 
they will then not really give appropriate blood supply to the brain and other organs, but particularly the brain. And then that happens, patients lose consciousness. And that's why you see patients who have a cardiac arrest lo abruptly lose consciousness, fall to the ground. And if that rhythm doesn't stop on its own pretty quickly, or someone doesn't deliver a shock with a defibrillator, then that rhythm can continue to get going and can be compromising in, the, in, in terms of being fatal. Sometimes. So that's a cardiac arrest, okay? In simple, I hope, concise way of describing it. I look at one as an electrical problem and the other as a plumbing problem. So your plumbing is your coronary arteries. When they get blocked up, heart attack can occur, myocardial damage can occur, and arrhythmia can occur as a consequence of that. So it's a right. stepped process. The electrical system of your heart, think of it like the electrical system in your house, turn on a breaker, turn off a breaker, short a wire. It's more electrical than structural. That's right. That's right. It's electrical, a cardiac arrest. It's an electro abnormal electrical event. But again, it's being caused by the structural changes that are present in the HCM heart. Okay? They make it more likely to occur. Mm -hmm. As you said, though, overall, just to be very clear, overall in HCM, it's very uncommon for a patient to experience a cardiac arrest. So it's a very uncommon occurrence, but it is more common in general in HCM than, if, for example, if you compare the rates of cardiac arrest in the general population, right? Just to be clear. Right? Okay. So that means, and because of obviously how important that event is, and it is a life-threatening event, as I just said, we have over decades now developed a strategy that we apply when we see patients in the clinic to determine if their risk of that happening with HCM is high enough that we would be concerned, therefore, and want to be able to then protect that patient from that adverse consequence of cardiac arrest. And the treatment here is the implantable cardioverter defibrillator, ICD. It's not drugs. That's the, just to be clear, right? We don't have drugs that can be protective enough for cardiac arrest in ACM. So it would be an ICD. So the decision that we're really faced with when we see patients, particularly for their first visit is, is that patient at increased risk for a cardiac arrest because of HCM? And we then um, have a strategy, as I was just saying, where we evaluate them for a number of what we call risk factors. These are results from the tests, from the history and the history, patient's history, the test results from imaging, test results from monitors, a whole slew of different things. And we look at these seven, I think seven different individual risk markers to see if they're present or not in a patient, because we know from studies that a patient with ATM who has one or more of those risk markers, that may be a scenario where that patient's risk is in fact increased for the, for, in the future for a cardiac arrest. And that may be when we would then discuss the treatment of the ICD. Okay? So that's the general principle that's at play and how we identify patients that could be at risk for life-threatening bottom chamber arrhythmias. Sounds so easy. Yeah, well, it it's actually, it sounds perhaps on the surface easy. Um, and, and in many cases, it could be very clear, you know, for example, patients have none of the risk markers. We know that's a very low risk situation, not zero risk. As you said, we never say zero risk, but very low, low enough that an ICD would not make sense perhaps to have. Mm -hmm. um, and there can be other situations that are very challenging where patients can fall into, you know, kind of borderline or gray areas with, with these risk markers that make the decision about an ICD very challenging. So to you as a physician evaluating an HCM patient, what are the most concerning risk factors and priority? Well, I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a great question because I think, let me just first say that we don't weight the risk markers. You know, a risk, the, the, the multiple risk markers, one of them may be enough in an individual patient to sort of say to us that that risk is high enough, okay? Um, and so we don't really, you know, look at it or have evidence to say one risk marker should be weighted or put more weight on that than another risk marker, because that's just not really how it how it's played out. So they 
So essentially, it's about one or more. That said, you know, I think we get particularly concerned when we see patients that are young, for example, that have really thick hearts, you know, what we call massive wall thickness. Patients that have kind of particularly ominous episodes where they have lost consciousness abruptly, what we call syncope. Mm -hmm. And patients that have, you know, a very malignant, meaning multiple family members, for example, who have died suddenly, you know, at a young age from HCM, you know, that's also particularly concerning. And all these risk markers, I've mentioned a few there, but, uh, but all of them carry greater weight in young middle-aged HCM patients. That's another important point. When an HCM patient, for example, has um, lived and achieved um, kind of advanced life, which we have sort of arbitrarily defined as 60 years or more, and haven't had any kind of arrhythmic event, their risk of sudden death or cardiac arrest is very, very low. They've sort of passed and lived through that higher risk period in HCM, which is actually young and middle-aged. So basically, essentially, to answer your question, we don't weight them differently. We really individualize the strategy. We look at all the risk markers, but we give greater weight to risk being increased in younger or middle-aged compared to older patients. So what are the risk factors? Okay, the risk factors are, and these are each of these are looked at, as I said, when we evaluate a patient. So the wall thickness of the heart muscle, you know, when it's extreme, in this disease, that increases risk. That's why it's a risk factor. We define that by you know making a measurement on the echo or the MRI, and if the wall thickness is 30 millimeters or more or close to that, that's a risk marker. As I mentioned too, when patients abruptly pass out, uh, what we call syncope, that can be a risk marker. When patients have um, a family history of one or more relatives, usually close relatives that have died from HCM or those deaths have been judged to be from HCM, that's another risk factor. And then extensive scarring in the heart muscle by MRI is a risk marker. When the pump function decreases in HCM, which happens in about three to 5% of patients uh, at some point, that's also increasing risk for sudden death or cardiac arrest. And then the monitor that patients wear, and this is why patients have to wear monitors. These are the monitors that are put on to evaluate for arrhythmias anywhere from two to 14 days. And we're looking in those monitors at short runs of these bottom chamber rhythms that patients may not feel, but would be detected by the, the monitor that they have on. So that's another risk factor. Okay. Um, and, 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 and in a rare instance that a patient develops an aneurysm of the apex, the tip of the heart is also a risk factor as well. So those are your, those are your, you know, those are what we look at. So how often should those factors be reevaluated? Can it change or it's always the same? Yeah. I mean, um, those risk factors really should be evaluated for in general, on a yearly basis in young to middle-aged patients, okay? It, no more than two years for sure, but, but, but more like one year annual. That's why we do annual visits. Did that include reassessing history, repeating imaging, and repeating the ambulatory monitor? The only exception to that is that we generally consider the MRI as something that can be repeated for reassessing the scar in the heart muscle not annually, but every usually three to five years, because we don't believe that the scar really changes that much over short periods of time. So that can be done um, at that length of time. Other thing, everything else should be annual. I'm going to take a minute to stay on the MRI for a minute. And you and I have been discussing sure. an issue here that um, I've seen happen a number of times. Mm -hmm. And it kind of speaks to why high volume centers with strong protocols based in the science related to HCM are so important. Um, mm -hmm. Is all scar on MRI or all non-properly functioning myocardium evaluated the same way? And does it have the same weight? And sh are all centers looking at it the same way at this moment? Yeah, I mean, I think you're asking a really great question that 
it really is about you know the reproducibility how well do measurements of scar burden in an atm patient by mri how well are they calculated in any one center and how well does that calculation compare if that was assessed at a different hcm center for example and i think that that this is a challenge right now for that risk factor because there can be too much variability sometimes in that calculation. Unfortunately, there's variability, okay? And that has to do, without getting into too much detail, it has to do a little bit with how the technique is done, the protocols, the imaging protocols that go into those, those, those images can vary. And so that, that really is why we are faced with that challenge. And so, you know, that makes it hard because sometimes you can get a different uh, assessment of that scar burden at one place versus another, which can be very frustrating. And I obviously can be very impactful if certain decisions are made um, on a, on a, on the MRI that, that may not be reflective of, of, of the truth. And so that is a problem right now that we're facing and trying to improve on. Here's my advice though. That is why it's really important and again, supports the idea of having these really critical assessments, particularly when we're talking about sudden death risk and the need for an ICD at an HCM center of excellence, because at least there you can, I hope, be a little bit more assured that the information that you're getting from a test like MRI is hopefully as reliable and accurate and precise as it can be, okay? Okay. In other words, when you start stepping out of HCM centers of excellence, this problem can be magnified even more. I'm going to take two seconds for a definition. Um, within the HCM heart, we can see fibrosis, and then you can see scarring. What's the difference between fibrosis and scar? Um, so fibrosis really uh, means is a general term that we use for scar tissue. So it, you can use that interchangeably. So fibrosis is sort of the more scientific term for scar tissue, okay? And so essentially when we look at the MRI and what we're calculating is a fibrosis burden, um, but we use the word scar and fibrosis kind of interchangeably, essentially. Can scars be different in their consistency and, and size versus an area of patchiness? Does the type of scar matter when you're looking at MRIs? We don't really know. So there's two, let me, so to dive into that, I think, you know, just a slight, with slightly greater detail, there's two types of scar in an HCM heart, okay? For those listening, this, the, the names may not be so important, but interstitial, and replacement scar. These are of two different types. When we image though, with the MRI, with the contrast, which is called gadolinium, it's really, that gadolinium is not specific for interstitial or replacement. You may, you, you're really looking at perhaps both scars together with gadolinium uptake, okay? And we don't know though, and so the, so the, 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 the point is that it's really all about the, the amount of gadolinium that matters rather than being able to differentiate between interstitial replacement scar, which we cannot do reliably yet by MRI. So if you're listening frequently to Tales from the Heart or other content from the HCMA, you'll, you'll always kind of figure out that something has popped up in, in my world at the HCMA where we came up with some questions related to a result. And this is one that's been coming up a bit lately is community-based MRIs have these larger numbers of scar when you compare it to when they go to a center and that same person's number looks a lot lower. And I've been trying to figure out why this is happening. And I think some lower level um, centers, and I don't mean that they're bad MRI centers, they just right. don't do a lot of HCM work. Right. They see interstitial fibrosis and they just call it all the same kind of scar. And that might have a different meaning for risk for that individual patient. And I think it's really important to, to meet with the experts to discuss to decide That's right. what is your scar burden and do you really want to consider a device at this point or not? Right. Um, I think there's a bunch of ICDs out there that were maybe put in for 
over protective purposes. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either, but it's just somebody's understanding might have been a little bit different. Um, okay. So we talked about a bunch of risk factors. Um, and then these people would get devices. Um, there's two kinds of ICDs today. There's subcutaneous ICDs and transvenous ICDs. Are they both on the table for HCM? Should one be primarily thought of as the go-to and the other as the alternative? Where are we with device today? Yeah, so once a decision's made that a patient is at increased risk for a cardiac arrest in HCM, then we then move to the next question, which is really what you're asking is, okay, an ICD is recommended, which device, since there are two, okay? The one that's been around the longest and the one we've then had the longest experience with is the transvenous device. That's the device where the generator is usually placed below the, the collarbone and the lead goes in the vein and into the heart. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. And, and, one, uh, and, and what was well recognized with that device is one, it's very effective. So it works very well to shock or abort life-threatening rhythms. But one of its downsides is that because the lead is in the vein and in the heart, um, over long periods of time, that lead can get damaged. And also when a lead is infected, and there's a small risk for that, that when it's been in for a long time in that position, it can be very challenging uh, to take out. And, and there's risks to taking or explanting those leads. And when we're talking about HCM, of course, we're talking about generally much younger patients than other forms of heart disease where these devices are going in. So this issue of the transvenous lead being associated with risks like that, infection, explant, vascular complications, means that the risk periods are often very long for pay of our patients. And so that was always a very important issue or limitation to the transvenous device. And that led to the um, uh, initiative to try to improve that, which is the subcutaneous ICD option which is an option where you have another, you have an ICD with a generator that's usually implanted not below the collarbone, right? But below the breast or the pec. And then it is attached to a lead. Sometimes these have been called leadless, but they have a lead. The lead goes under the skin, parallel to the sternum, right? So not in a vein and not in the heart. And what we know then today, so that then that's helpful because that gets around the issues that we just spoke about with the transvenous leads in the vein and in the heart, okay? So then what we know today then, and those have been around, those subcutaneous, they're not brand new. They've been around now for almost 10 years in terms of their experience. So they're not new and therefore they're not experimental. I think we're on the second or third version of them actually right now, two or three, right? So, so the major difference then between the two right now, between transvenous, and sub -Q, we believe that they both are equally effective to abort a life-threatening rhythm in an HCM patient if they need it at some point after it's implanted. So efficacy, what we call efficacy, doing what it should do looks to be similar. What looks to be a little different is inappropriate shock. What we just talked about was an appropriate shock. But is different though, is inappropriate, shocking for a rhythm that it shouldn't shock you for. And that's still today slightly higher with the subcutaneous device than the transvenous. Yep. The second difference is that the, the subcutaneous today, the current version cannot pace the heart at all. There's no pacing capability. So if you are an HCM patient who needs that also, and that sometimes comes up, to be able to pace if the heart goes too slow, the sub Q cannot do that. Okay. Those are the major differences. The other one I'll put before you step in, the other put just so I don't forget, is that you have to screen, be screened, I should say, for the sub Q option, just so everybody listening knows. And that's a special EKG that's done to make sure that some patients are just at too great a risk for inappropriate shocks with the sub Q because of their EKG, their electrical impulses. And therefore we don't put in the device. That happens about 10% of time. 90% of patients with HCM screen in and have that option available. Okay. 
I think it's really important that people meet with an expert here as well, because I've seen kind of a push towards the SICD and people being told, well, you're young. We want to keep those leaves out of your heart as long as possible. Makes all the sense in the world. However, if there's a potential for some pacing that's going to be needed in the next short while, maybe three to five years, and an expert in HCM might be able to predict that better than a community EP, um, then you're looking at a device replacement if you might need additional services from that unit later. Right. So, please consult with an expert before you make a decision to device up because you might have to make a change pretty quickly thereafter. And when right. they're in there, you want to let them stay in there for a good long time. Yep. That's right. We generally try not to take them out unless there's a really good reason. That's right. Okay. So those are the ventricular arrhythmias. Um, we'll talk about medical management at the end of the session here, but um, I want to kind of just talk about the identification of high risk, device therapy. Yes, we can use current meds to manage as well, but we're pretty much talking about saving you from an arrhythmia with a device. Um, so I want to talk about the more complicated and annoying arrhythmia associated with HCM in much greater numbers, and that is atrial fibrillation can start as an A flutter and then go to an A fib, and there's some controversy over what's fib and what's flutter. I've been watching those articles for 30 years. Um, so what is atrial fibrillation? What is atrial flutter? And why are patients with HCM at a pretty significant risk of developing this atrial arrhythmia? Yeah. So before we get to atrial, one other quick point I just want to make about the bottom chamber before we oh, leave. Okay. Thing. Sorry. Yeah. One I other left quick the chamber. Thing. Yeah. No, just so we don't uh, keep it, you know, keep it um, grouped together. So basically, as we said, there really is no drug therapy that we give to prevent life-threatening rhythms from the bottom chamber. That's the ICD. But some patients with HCM can have symptoms related to premature single beats from the bottom chamber, right? Yeah, good point. Right, which we call premature ventricular contraction or PVC. It's a single extra beat. It's often kind of strong extra beat. So patients sometimes feel those. Um, they're a nuisance. They're not life-threatening. They're a pain in the butt if they occur frequently because patients feel them. And those can be treated sometimes effectively with drugs. So just to be clear about that. Okay, so PVCs are the most annoying thing ever. Right. Because they constantly remind you that your heart's not right. Right. And they disrupt your day. They're right. more disruptors than dangers. That's right. And um, having lived with many, 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 many of them for many, many years, um, it's for the concept that it's not life-threatening, it's life-annoying. It's also one of the arrhythmias that I found personally, and I've spoken to many others who agree with me, emotionally and psychologically disrupting because you're having a normal day, you're feeling pretty good. Then all of a sudden, the thud, the yep. thud, and you get this feeling and you're like, oh gosh, here we go. It's yep. going to be a really bad day. And then it just goes away, but it distracts you. That's right. So please discuss that feeling with your physician. There are medications that can be used that calm that feeling. Yep. Um, they are annoying. PVCs. Yeah, and, and unnerving, you know, for a lot of people. So that's a really important point. Bring that up if that's something that you're feeling. There are drugs that can be very effective at mitigating those extra beats. Okay. Or let me point out, we just had yeah. somebody post that they had their... Um, their event monitor come back and it said that they had 15,000 PVCs over their event monitor. These crazy numbers that seem so high. Um, you know, I was having more PVCs than regular beats at the end of my heart. So it was kind of funny. Like my numbers were almost equal. It was, it was not good. Um, but they're annoying, not life-threatening. <clears throat> and even the high numbers are not terrible. You want to talk about high PVC burden? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we, that's a little bit of a gray area. I mean, it's, first, let me just say, it's very unusual that a patient with HCM has a really high burden of these uh, at any one period of time for them. So, you know, that's a sort of you, you a different kind of situation where, you know, a patient may be getting them or feeling them a lot. You put the monitor on and there's, you know, as you just said, thousands and thousands over a week or two. That's, 
So we, we don't have any clear, you know, sort of evidence that that increases risk for life-threatening issues. But that said, I think that's the scenario where I would say pause. You need to really have that investigated with your HCM physician. We got to make sure there are not other causes to that going on for a patient. And that really needs to be kind of looked at particularly carefully, as opposed to less frequent PVCs that are just causing patients to feel symptoms. Okay. Good answer. Okay. Yeah. Are we done in the ventricle? Yeah, I think, we that's, leave the chamber? I think we're, yeah, we're good. So let's go, let's go upstairs. Let's go north. Let's go north. Yeah. <laughs> go upstairs to the uh, atria, which are the upper chambers. Um, and the focus there, as you just said, is on atrial fibrillation, irregular rhythm, top chamber. And so why are HCM hearts more prone to atrial arrhythmias? Yeah. So when you when a patient goes into atrial fibrillation, what happens is they lose the contribution of the left upper chamber pumping blood to the bottom chamber. Because normally that left upper chamber, when a patient's in a regular rhythm, is nice and one-to-one -one with the lower chamber, right? It's contracting the left upper. It's actually pushing blood into the lower chamber, right? So now imagine you go into atrial fibrillation. What that means is that you lose that contraction. It, it, it fib, it's fibrillating. It's not an organized, efficient contraction anymore. That's gone acutely. Like literally in one second, when you go into atrial fibrillation, you lose that, okay? And that means that you lose the ability of the left atrium to contribute the normal amount of blood flow to the bottom chamber. Okay? And that's particularly concerning in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because we're already starting with a lower chamber that is a smaller size than a normal heart, right? Because of the increase in wall thickness. So HCM heart then is particularly dependent or wants as efficient blood supply or filling as it can get each heartbeat. And when you eliminate that with atrial fibrillation, you are right away decreasing by 20% or more the contribution of blood flow to the bottom chamber, okay? which makes the pump inefficient. And makes then patients just, to kind of, that's what makes patients feel poor. And what about the rate of the atrial fibrillation? How does that contribute to feeling poorly? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of variability. So when you go into atrial fibrillation, what happens is that you lose that upper contribution from the left atrium because it's fibrillating. But the bottom chamber, though, can start to go very fast, trying to make up for things, so to speak. And so that increase in heart rate with atrial fibrillation is also a problem. Okay. That said, you can feel crappy in atrial fibrillation with HCM with heart rates that are not that fast too, just because you lose that contribution, but you're more likely to feel bad if the heart rates are high, okay? So that's the, the sort of the message on, on that. So what do we do to treat atrial fibrillation in HCM? Yeah, what we do is depends a little bit on a number of, you know, factors, okay? One, perhaps, well, let me, let me back up because I think the most important thing in terms of to do, let's talk about when we to do here, mm -hmm. and there's two consequences to atrial fibrillation. That's the point, two consequences. So a patient with HCM that has atrial fibrillation, what does it matter? Why does it, what, what's the, two issues are, it can make patients feel poorly when they go in, so it can decrease quality of life. Yep. And two, it can increase substantially the risk of stroke, right? So atrial fibrillation in HCM increases risk of a stroke because when the atrium is fibrillating, then clot, blood clot can occur in that area, specifically in a structure of the left upper chamber called the appendage, because blood is stasis, there's co it coagulates then, and then becomes a clot that can then be dislodged and pumped up to the brain to cause a stroke, okay? So those are the two consequences 
symptoms and stroke. So the first, let's just handle the first thing. Stroke risk is very high when a patient starts to develop atrial fibrillation with ATM. Even with a first episode, we will often recommend to be protected against that with a blood thinner. Those are things like Eliquis, Zeralto, those drugs, what we call oral anticoagulation drugs, protect patients against stroke, uh, stroke by thinning the blood. And patients really should be on that with any significant evidence of atrial fibrillation in HCM. Is there still a role for warfarin in HCM? Well, much HCM. warfarin is the old one, right? I mean, which, which was obviously much more challenging, is much more challenging to use because you have to monitor the blood levels and there are certain foods that interact with warfarin that, that change its levels in the blood. And so it was always a much more challenging drug to, for patients to use and more inconvenient because you had to have blood drawn frequently, at least in the beginning, to get those levels therapeutic. What we know is that the newer drugs um, uh, are as effective as effective as protecting against stroke as Coumadin and have really no more side effects than Coumadin um, and therefore have sort of generally replaced warfarin in almost all cases, although there can be some exceptions. That's the deal. <clears throat> okay. That just came up the other day too. Should somebody get off of warfarin after they've been on it for a long time? It's like, if it's Well, you got to consult your doctor, but in most cases, the answer to that is yes, you can. In most cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we know we have to protect them from stroke. We know right. we want to keep the rate good. So we use medications right. for that. Uh, what else can be done to try to stop atrial fibrillation? Um, yeah, so... There, the, the reason to try to stop it is in large part driven by the patient saying that when they go into it, they feel terrible. And they're going into it frequently enough, perhaps, that that is starting to, in totality, really frustrate them because it's impacting their quality of life. Okay, that's a, just the general principle rule for what then drives us to try to stop atrial fibrillation from occurring. And there's two ways to do that. Antiarrhythmic drugs, pills that a patient can take that are intended to stop the patient from going into atrial fibrillation. Okay? And those drugs are, there's certain, you know, a number of those drugs that are available to do that. They have pros and cons to them, um, as well as different types of efficacy and side effects. That's a, an important discussion if that's the option for you about which of the ones to have and understanding really completely what the risks and benefits are. And the second option that we can do is an ablation, okay, which is a catheter-based procedure with catheters that are advanced into the heart with radio frequency energy, so types of energy in the catheter applied to that left upper chamber area to alter the structure of it to hopefully decrease, or in some cases even eliminate the AFib from starting, the, from propagating, from beginning, by doing that, by altering the structure. And that's called a AFib ablation, or sometimes what's called a pulmonary vein ablation, because that's the, uh, that's the area of the left atrium where the AFib is, is usually originating from. So those are your two options. <laughs> and rare, well, in other cases, if somebody were going in for something like a myectomy, is there anything else they can do to treat their atrial arrhythmias? Yeah. So, yes. So we have a third option. Thanks for raising that, which is a surgical therapy for atrial fibrillation, which is called a Cox maze procedure. Okay. Cox maze procedure. That is almost always done at the time of open heart surgery. In the case of you know, us, that's myectomy patients, okay? So what that means is that patients that have the decision to move forward with myectomy because of symptoms related to the obstruction, but they also have a history of paroxysmal, meaning coming and going, atrial fibrillation. What we usually suggest is that at the time of the myectomy, during the operation, that a Cox maze procedure is also done adjunctively in addition to. And what that is, is that the surgeon applies, just like I spoke about with the catheter, 
radio frequency and other forms of energy to the left upper chamber, again, as a way to modify the structure of the left atrium to help stop the AFib from starting. That's generally only done during myectomy, although there can be examples of a, do, uh, of a cox maze being done just on its own without a myectomy, but that's much more rare. Yeah, I'm aware of, I think, one in right. years of a standalone. Exactly. Right. Typically, it's done with a myectomy. Okay. Oh, that's right. So in the event that somebody tries a pulmonary vein ablation or catheter-based ablation, um, what can they look at in terms of success rates? Because I think there's nothing more frustrating than thinking you're going to do a procedure and it's always going to work 100% of the time and it doesn't, and then you're disappointed. Um, so what is the success rate of pulmonary vein ablations in HCM? Yeah, I mean, I think what we say, you know, again, we're talking, you know, we're, it could be different a little bit with individual patients, depending on their kind of clinical profile and their heart. But in general, the way we usually talk about efficacy, that's what you're talking about, success of the AFib ablation, is that in HCM, you know, between 50 to 70% of patients who undergo that procedure will achieve a significant reduction in the number of atrial fibrillation episodes and also possibly in some cases complete elimination of the AFib. Even in the contemporary the current era with that procedure, you know, there are patients, you know, perhaps a substantial proportion who will require to achieve that goal two AFib ablations though. Um, Sometimes one just isn't enough because the area wasn't, you know, treated as effectively as as, it, 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 as we wanted it to be, where a second AFib ablation would be indicated. So that's not uncommon either. Yeah, I think it's like 40% have good yeah. success with the first one, 40% will have success with the second one. Right. And if we move past that, it could be 20 or 30% success rate, depending upon the operator. And I think our hearts are like crafty little buggers. You know, we, we kill a pathway. It's like, I'll find another one. So sometimes we have to go after those new pathways that the heart has created to let that electrical current go through. And it takes some time. I think people get frustrated when you say, here's the therapy. And then it fails after a year or two years, or sometimes even after a couple of months. So having realistic expectations of success, I think are really important to help your mental health get through these processes, but they're worth trying because it's better to be in sinus rhythm, normal rhythm, than into an atrial arrhythmia. Right. So, so let me just say one other thing on that, you know, because we're getting kind of close. To, so I think that as a principal rule here to maybe sort of take home message, so to speak, is that we've become more and more aggressive, I think, in trying to be er in, in, in the in the earlier in the course of patients move to more definitive therapy, meaning with the ablation, to try to maintain regular rhythm rather than waiting longer for that decision to make. Because the longer a patient is experiencing a fib in and out, in and out, even on drugs the more likely we may get to a point where it would be impossible or nearly impossible to ever get them back into a regular rhythm that they could stay in. So kind of the principal message there is this earlier intervention is generally the movement we're going to when we talk about therapy for AFib in HCM. So I want to talk about <clears throat> one of the items that I look at when, when we're working with a new uh, client and they're trying to understand their own individual anatomy. There are key numbers that I try to get them to understand about themselves so they can have good conversations with their teams. And one of them is what is your left atrial dimension? And, yeah. you know, can we talk about the role of left atrial dimension and why it's something you kind of want to just know where it is and know where it's trending? That's right. Great question. Yeah. Thanks for you know, bringing that up, you know, because it's an important part of this discussion. So, so here's the, um, here's sort of the bottom line there is that, you know, patients that often ask like, what, you know, what, what's the, you know, what's the biggest predictor that I could go into atrial fibrillation at some point with HCM? Not all patients do. It's about 30% of HCM patients will go in, will have one or more episodes of atrial fibrillation. So not all, so that's an important point, but an important group 
And so patients then ask, you know, so they hear about AFib and how bad it can be for patients in this disease. What predicts that? The greatest predictor that we have is the, the size of the left atrium, um, how big the left atrium diameter is on the imaging, on the echo or the MRI, is our biggest, biggest predictor of when that of, of whether a patient will go in in the future into atrial fibrillation. So what we do then is kind of watch those patients maybe a little bit more closely for the development of AF. You know, and there's also other ways that can be done today that we didn't have available five or 10 years ago. These are home monitoring devices where, you know, patients can track their rhythm issues there and so forth. And so essentially left atrial side is an important predictor. And then we watch those patients with them that have really big left atrium. We watch them a little bit closer. Okay. So left atrial dimension matters. No, your left atrial dimension. <clears throat> okay. Um, I do want to talk about one other aspect of atrial fibrillation, and that is if somebody tries to get out and they can't, and they're stuck in chronic atrial fibrillation, we see some of those patients drop their ejection fraction over time because the ventricle is trying to keep up with the atria and we, we find that it kind of gets burnt out a bit. Can you talk about what that is and why that happens in some patients and what should we do? Yeah, here's the here's the kind of the take home message there. Um, and that's that. Hold on one sec. <laughs> we have children home today. You're on mute. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm on duties today. Um, so here's the deal. The bottom line is this, is that we don't want HCM patients to be in atrial fibrillation with high heart rates for long periods of time because that high heart rate in atrial fibrillation over time can impact the structure of the heart and the function of the heart. And so that's a really important issue. That is why it's really, really important to be on top of this issue very early so that heart rates are controlled and also whether a strategy of maintaining regular rhythm is, is necessary as opposed to being subjected to lots of AFib with high heart rates. Uh, even if you're not symptomatic, by the way, with those higher heart rates, you don't wanna be in them because of the potential impact on altering the structure of the heart in a bad way. We've had a couple of our, our people go off to transplant from that pathway because right. the F grows way too low and the heart just can't function anymore. So. Arrhythmias matter in HCM. We want to we want to identify them. We yep. want to mitigate the risk with devices or therapies and drugs that help right. us stay in more normal rhythm. That's right. So um, the only other thing that we really didn't dive into too much, and it's a small, rare subset, but can you talk for just a quick second on apical aneurysm and risk of uh, arrhythmia due to atrial or atrial, sorry, apical aneurysms? Too many yeah. A words here. Yeah, right. Well, you know, about 5% of patients with HCM or maybe a little bit less can develop at some point in their life with HCM, a aneurysm at the bottom of the heart, what we call the apex. Okay. And that is what that means. An aneurysm, it's a general term where here, what we're talking about is a thinning of the muscle. So instead of thick, it actually becomes thin and is a sort of almost a thin rim at the bottom of the heart that doesn't contract and it's comprised of scar, essentially. And that additional abnormal structure of scar increases the risk already on top of a heart that, that can have this happen of ventricular arrhythmias, that bottom chamber rhythm that we talked about in the beginning. That is why an aneurysm is now a risk factor for cardiac arrest in HCM and may itself be the reason that you may have a discussion with your HCM cardiologist about an ICD device to protect you against life threatening rhythms that would be originating from the aneurysm area. Perfect. That, that is very, very helpful as we wrap up aneurysms and arrhythmias yep. and A words in HCM. Probably should do this in January, start out the year, <laughs> start the al alphabet. Um, so these are all really important topics that people need to discuss with their doctors and understand their individualized risks. Right. We're going to be talking more in the coming months about other factors that may weigh in that we're still learning about, like genetics. A lot of, a lot of emphasis at ACC on genetics this year. Um, and I think we have to take it in context that 
we know some of the genes that cause HCM and some of those are going to be actionable and some of them have potentially higher arrhythmia risks than others. And there's a bunch of conversation being had about what should we do about this? So I think we're going to be diving into discussions in that realm coming up. Um, I have a couple of comments here. Jimmy's been having some issues that are electrical, but they're difficult to catch. So if a patient thinks they're having atrial arrhythmias or ventricular arrhythmias or any arrhythmias, and they can't capture the event, what monitoring technology could we be looking at in today's world to help figure this out? Right. Well, I mean, there's a couple options. One would be you could, you know, you could have a, a small device implanted right under the skin. It's called an implantable loop recorder. I, Look, I have one in my hand. There it is. Little guy. There it is. That's right. Little guy, very low risk to put in. Can stay in for years and collect a lot of information. And that's one option for sure with low risk to no risk almost. Two would be, we talked a little bit, touched on this was, would be the, exactly, these are um, what we call wearable, patient wearable devices. Um, there are different forms of those. The Apple Watch, there are um, independent um, third party. Garmin and. Right, right Garmin and. Uh, um, Fitbit and. Right. All, the, all these different devices. They're That's pretty right. good. And the Cardio Net or Cardio, uh, sorry, the other one. Uh, what's that? Uh, sorry, cardio. The, it used yeah. to be a live core, but yeah, core, cardio right. monitoring, yeah. Right. So, you know, they've all gotten some level, I think, of FDA approval to um, convey information related to atrial fibrillation through those devices to the patients, to the consumer, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so that can be another way of, um, you know, detecting or hoping to detect AFib um, at any point using one or more of those options. So arrhythmias matter. Yep. And we should make sure that people are getting assessed appropriately. And I think we took some deep dives into arrhythmias today. Um, and I think uh, we're going to put this up in the website as well so that people can uh, get access uh, to learn more about arrhythmias. It's 2023. This data does evolve. So if you're listening to this sometime in the future, um, remember that we're all still learning together and we are all assessing new risk markers and things evolve and change. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for pod, uh, our podcast, Tales from the Heart, which includes Cytokinetics, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Tanaya Therapeutics, and Embrya uh, Pharmaceutical as well. So we want to thank all of them for their support of this and other educational programming offered by the HCMA. And Dr. Marin, I thank you for joining us once again on Tales from the Heart. Thanks for having me. I thought that was a good discussion today. And I think that gives a hopefully a good overview and review of both upper and chamber rhythm issues, which are so important, as you said. So hopefully people will find that to be helpful. Okay. One very cute thing happened during this and you don't even know that it happened. I think when Bodhi came running in, that was Bodhi coming in, right? I, his face just kind of popped up out of the blur for a second. <laughs> just adorable. How old is he now? He, he's, uh, he just turned five. So. Damn. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a good it kid. Happens, it happens yeah. quick. Yeah, it does. It's, um, it is sort of amazing. There's no question about that. Um, so I'm trying to get it all in while I can. So, you know, we all do this multitasking now and, uh, I, I love the world that we live in that you can, you can podcast cardiology and be dad simultaneously. This is the way we rock. And then go back to being cardiology right now. And then so. go back to being cardiology. All right. Well, we're going to let you get back to that. And right. we thank you for joining us and right. say goodbye to Facebook. Sounds good. Take care. Good to